Money is the equivalent of energy. So you can buy energy with your cash. And the significance about that is if you're frugal and take care of your money and keep a balance, then you always have this energy in your bank account, energy in which you can live. However, obviously, if you waste this energy, then you actually interfere with your own survival. So you don't really want to go out and just throw away your money. And so basically, I really want to show you that this is an important insight into the nature of our own health and our biology and the world we create in this regard. That our biological system, the cells, rely on energy. Without energy, there's no life. So fundamentally, you have an energy budget that gives you life. And in fact, in the body, energy is in coins called ATP, molecules that represent units of energy. So in fact, biologists refer to ATP as the coin of the realm. The significance of ATP is this, is that ATP molecules are like units of gasoline, like gallon of gas, that are used to fuel our biological processes. So to stay alive, we have to have all this ATP. So there's an ATP account in your body right now. But the question is, how do you use this ATP? And now here's an important fact, that 25% of the total energy in your whole body is used to operate your brain. So all of a sudden you start to recognize that the brain uses energy at the rate of muscles of a marathon runner. So a brain and muscle activity are pretty much the same. And so why is this important? Because as you're using your brain, as you're using your thinking, you are actually using energy. Now why is this relevant? The answer is very simply this. Because the way we've been using our thoughts are not necessarily productive. As a matter of fact, sometimes our investments of our thoughts are actually counterproductive because our thoughts create a reality that we then have to overcome. So basically it says that we must start to become aware of our thoughts. And why is this important? Because thoughts represent units of energy. Every time you have a thought, you use energy. Why this becomes relevant is, if I give you a checkbook for your bank account, you don't go down the street and just write checks to people like, oh, hey, you're a nice looking guy. Here's 10 bucks for you. And oh, here, little girl, go out and buy yourself a little car. Here's a thousand dollars for you. And you don't give away your money. Why? Because giving away your money is giving away your life. So basically you become very frugal when you have a checkbook in your hand. Now what I'm trying to tell you is this. You have an energy budget in your body. The energy is what keeps you alive. When you start using energy and writing checks where you get no return from your energy, then it's exactly the same as writing checks out of your bank checkbook and giving away your cash. So why this becomes important is the biology of belief reveals how our thoughts create our reality. And if you start investing in thoughts, that are counterproductive, thoughts like fear, or what am I gonna do, and how am I gonna escape this problem, or how's this gonna go wrong, and all these other kinds of thoughts that are negative kinds of thoughts, then realize this, you are actually not just using your energy for having these thoughts, but these thoughts are also what come into your reality. What you focus on with your thoughts, your brain will manifest as reality. Everything you do in your life, you put out energy for. Therefore, start to review what you're doing in your life. Because if you're putting your energy into things you cannot change in this world, that is exactly the same as writing a check and just throwing away your money to the outside because you get nothing back from it. So think about this very interesting reality that you have this energy checkbook. And every time you use energy, you have to say, is the use of this energy going to enhance my life or is it just wasted energy? Am I getting involved in a, in a political argument with people where I'm gonna use up all my energy and will I have changed the world? No. Am I gonna use up all my energy to try to convince other people to change their life or change their way of living to make them even healthier and they're not ready to do that? I'd be wasting my energy. So here's an interesting thought. If I gave you an energy checkbook and asked you to write a check every time you had to have a thought, you would have to then ask yourself is, is this thought going to enhance my life or is this thought going to take away from my life? And then when you start to realize that, you start to direct your actions where you put your energy into things that enhance your life and give you an opportunity to survive and to go beyond survival and really into thriving. So the point is this, we are facing some rough times. The more thoughts you put into the negative aspect, the more thoughts you put into the fear, uh, not only are you just wasting your energy, but as in the biology belief, 
these negative thoughts, these negative stresses actually impair your immune system and bring on disease itself. And in 1925, physicists said that our vision of a universe split into an invisible energy realm and a material physical realm was a total illusion. That everything is energy, a whole thing, there is no matter in this world. And to summarize what the meaning was, a, a famous physicist in 1930 by the name of Sir James Jeans said, we have been led to believe that the universe is a great machine when in fact it is more a great thought. And the reality about that was quantum physicists have established since 1925 that consciousness is the primary mechanism of creativity of the world that we experience. In fact, a more recent article in the journal Nature, which is like a, a, a scientific mainstream journal, was an article by a quantum physicist at Johns Hopkins University by the name of Richard Con Henry. And his article was entitled The Mental Universe. I, I, I know the last two lines in the article because they were like so powerful. And here's what the conclusion of the article was. The universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual. Live and enjoy. And this is so exciting because science is coming out saying it mental and spiritual. It's like, oh my God. But that's the quantum physics part. And the reality about it, why is that so important, as uh, Sadhviji had just mentioned, it's our thoughts that are manifesting this world. Now you could say that's a spiritual thing, and now I say not only is it spiritual, now it is fundamental basic science of the universe. And it says then the thoughts are creative. Well, if the thoughts are creative, then who is having the thought? And you start to realize I'm having the thought. Well, then the truth is simple. As Richard Con Henry said, you are creating this world with your mental activity and your spirituality combined. And then all of a sudden it says, well then if I'm creating the world, then my original belief that when things didn't go right, I was a victim. <laughs> the universe wasn't supporting me. You know, it's like, oh, I try so hard and the universe is not giving me things. It turns 180 degrees around. And it basically says this, we are creating this world. And then I say, your mind is creating this world. And then I give you the science that says there are two minds that are operating at the same time. One is called the conscious mind and one is called the subconscious mind. I say, what's the difference? The conscious mind is where you are as a spirit, an entity, a unique identity. You are in that conscious mind and perceiving the world. I say, what about the subconscious mind? It's not a creative mind. The subconscious mind is habits, things that you've learned and you experienced in your life, and they become habits. So uh, the subconscious mind is not thinking, creating. It's subconscious mind, push the button, play the behavior. So here's the point. When we are in our conscious mind, we are connecting our spirituality to the biology and the physical planet that we're in. And that is the creative mind. That's the one you wake up in the morning and say, oh, I wish I had this and I desire that and these are the things I want. And then you go out and start the day and then guess what? 95% of the day, you are not operating from the conscious mind. Science has recognized 95% of the day because we are thinking 95% of the day, our behavior is now controlled by the subconscious mind. I go, okay, so what's the difference in the final conclusion of this is the conscious mind with your creativity has your wishes and your desires. The subconscious mind was programmed by other people, your mother, your father, your siblings, and your community. So what is the difference? You wake up with a wish and a desire of what you want, and then the rest of the day, you play the programs that you got from other people that don't answer your wishes and don't support your desires, and all you see is the consequence of it and go, oh my God, why is it not working? And the answer is, because you don't see, because remember the name is subconscious, below conscious. So when that behavior is playing, 
psychologists will tell us 70% or more of the programs in the subconscious are disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting behaviors. So the simple reality is this. We have great wishes and desires, and yet our life is not controlled by that. Our life is controlled by the programming, and that programming is the disempowering program. So all you see is the consequence of the invisible subconscious, which will sabotage all the desires and wishes you have. And then to conclude that, <laughs> What if you just didn't default to the subconscious? What if you just stayed in the conscious mind? That's called being mindful. And why is it relevant? Because when you stay conscious, keep your mind present, you are the creator of your life. And when people are in mindfulness, they manifest their wishes, their desires, and their happiness. So for all of us, it's sort of a wake-up call. You think you're running your life with your wishes and desires? It's an illusion. You're really running your life with your programs acquired from other people. When you're putting in a wish and a desire, put it in as if you already have it. I am healthy. Uh, I am a good relationship person. Uh, you know, uh, I have a great job. What's that? I say, it's like I already have it. And yet most people don't have it. So they'll say, I want a great job. I want a great relationship. I want to be healthy. And I go, make a recording of those words. We just said that. I want to be healthy. Today, right now, Tuesday, we're going to make a recording. I say, now come back in one year and let's push the button on that recording. And we come back a year later and it says, I want to be healthy. I go, it's a whole year and you still want to be healthy. I still don't have it, right? <laughs> you didn't say I am healthy. You, uh -huh. All you're emphasizing, I have a desire to be healthy. I want to be healthy. I have a yeah. desire to be healthy. And I go, you can have that desire the rest of your life. You're not going to get healthy. Mm -hmm. You want to be healthy, you say, I am healthy. But then you look and say, yeah, but in reality, I'm sick. And I go, no, no. The function of the mind is to take the program and turn it into reality. So if I am sick, but I put a program in, I am healthy, the mind looks uh, you know, like, well, wait a second, the program is I am healthy, but the body is not healthy, so what's the function of the mind? Create health in the body. It doesn't change the program, it changes the body. And so the idea is this, every time we put a program in, it has to be as if you already have it, in spite of the fact you could be dying of cancer. I go, I am healthy. <laughs> it sounds kind of weird. And I go, don't worry about it. Just put it on, I am healthy. Because once it is a program, the function of the mind is to manifest it as reality. Mm -hmm. That's the part. And so my little caveat, mm -hmm. you brought it up. And I'm emphasizing it. And that was simply this, that whatever you're downloading, you have to say it as if you already have it. Because if you put a future tense on it, I will, I want, I say, if you record that, uh, that means you will always will, you know, want to have it, you know, mm -hmm. I will do this, you won't get there. So uh, I just wanted to bring that in because if we're making a program, then you must make sure it says as if you already have it in spite of the fact you don't. You as an identity are in your conscious mind. You actually are in there. That's where your personal identity is. And we have a tendency to say, if I talk to myself, I'm going to give myself a good talking to, and I'm going to change that subconscious. I say to myself, Bruce, don't do that again. Do this. Don't do that again. And, and then I say, it's very frustrating. Why? You can talk until you're blue in the face and nothing will change. I say, why? And the answer is, and this is the most important part, there is nobody in the subconscious. There's nothing there, it's a machine. <laughs> it's a record playback device, so you can talk to the machine as much as you want. If you don't know how to push the record button, nothing's gonna happen. So then I say, how do you change the program? I say, how did you get the program? The first seven years, your brain was in theta, hypnosis. So I say, you wanna change the program? Every night when you go to bed, just as your mind disconnects, just as you fall into sleep, your brain is now operating in theta. So if you put earphones on your head and you play a tape, a program, a CD of what you want, as your, your conscious mind disconnected, your subconscious is downloading. So you just play that tape as you go to bed 
and after a number of playings, your subconscious will learn the new program without even your conscious being involved. That's number one. After age seven, how do we put a program in? Repetition. How did you do anything? You repeated it over and over again. How long did it take you to learn the alphabet? How many times did you have to go from A to Z before you could remember the whole alphabet? When you drove a car, you didn't know how to drive a car until you did what? You practiced, you repeated. So if you want to change a program, you put into your mind a repetition. And it's not, uh, it, it recognize this, what you want to change doesn't exist. So when you put in the new program, it'll sound strange. So let's say you are sick, you have a disease, and I say, what program do I want? I am healthy. I go, it doesn't sound right. I know I'm sick. I say, I don't care. There's a saying in English, fake it until you make it. What that means is, if you want to be happy, just keep in your mind, I am happy. I smile, even if you have to force a smile, I am happy, I'm smiling, I say repeat this and repeat this, and guess what? After a short time, it becomes a habit. And when you're in that habit, you don't even have to think I am happy, the new habit will keep you happy all the time because that's the new program. In today's world, mm -hmm. I love the phrase because it is funny, but it's true, fake it till you, you make, make it. it. <laughs> Yes. Meaning, you want to be happy? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to habituate happy. You mm -hmm. have to say every day, no matter if you don't, if you're not happy, I don't really care. You have to tell yourself, I am happy. Mm -hmm. I am happy. You have to repeat it. Ah, habituation, mm -hmm. repetition. Why? I'm consciously repeating it every day. I'm looking at my life. My life really sucks. Oh, Bruce, I am happy. I am ha I'm saying that. I go, well, why are you saying it? Because repetition mm -hmm. is how the subconscious mind learns. I say, why is this relevant? And here's the fun part. Because after I've repeated it a number of times, the subconscious says, okay, I'm happy. I've learned this. I go, why is it relevant? Then 95% of the day, the subconscious function is to make that program real. If my program mm -hmm. is I am happy, the function of the mind is to make sure I'm happy. <laughs> if, the, if the program says I'm going to get cancer because I heard that from somebody else, mm -hmm. then the function of the mind is to make sure I get cancer because that's the belief I'm working with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if if it says I am a victim and I can't get out of this, then the function of the mind is, yep, look, you see, you, I'm showing you, you're a victim, and you can't get out of it because I'm running the show. You're a victim. Okay, I have a spiritual part, and I have a, this physical part, and I ask a simple question: I said, Why have a body? Why not just be the spirit? And then. This is when I found out I had Jewish comedian cells. I go, I go, I asked a question of myself. Why have a body? Why not just be a spirit? And 50 trillion cells in my body welled up with an answer. And I said, the answer, what, what was it? I said, I asked a question. The answer came back in the form of a question. That's where the Jewish comedian guy came in. I, go, I asked, why have both a spirit and a body? And the cells answered with this. Quote, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? <laughs> and all of a sudden I said, oh my God, that was the most profound thing in the entire world. I said, why? Because this is like a virtual reality suit. I can see with these eyes. I can smell, I can taste, I can hear. And I go, so what, why is it relevant? Well, as I said, the question came out, if you're a spirit only, and Saad Vijay and I are in the spirit world, and we're saying love is such a beautiful thing, it's the harmony and the connection and everything, I said, yeah, but what does love feel like? You go, as a spirit, how the heck do I know? It's, but I said, oh, you have to have the chemistry of the body and a nervous system that translates the chemistry into sensation. Sensation is not chemistry, it's electromagnetic vibration. It's a broadcast. Uh, and I say, so why is it relevant? Uh, so we add one little part. I go, what? We think our thoughts are in our head. And so we put wires on our head called the electroencephalograph. And I can read your brain activity. I go, yeah, inside your head, you've got all this consciousness going on. And then I go, you know, there's a new technology that reads brain activity as well. It's not electroencephalograph, EEG. It's called magnetoencephalograph, M-E-G. And I go, so what's the difference? They both read consciousness. I go, yeah, and what's the difference? 
magnetoencephalograph, the probe is out here. It doesn't even touch your head. You know, stop. I say, why? You're reading my thoughts out here? And all of a sudden it's like, my thoughts are not contained in my head? No, they're broadcast back to the field. I go, I can read your thoughts from out here? So whatever you're thinking, positive or negative, or the, I can do this, I can't do that. So it's not staying in here. It's going out into the world and the universe around us. And then I say, so what's the relevance? There's something called resonance. When two things are in vibration, if one vibrates, the other one will vibrate. Okay. And if they're not in harmony, one vibrates and the other doesn't do anything. So I say, so what does it mean? Oh my God, this is so changed life stuff. I go, my thoughts are vibration that go out into the energy field, which is quantum physics. I go, so what? I say, my thought will only vibrate and resonate with something that matches the thought. If I send out a thought of love, only elements that are in love, that vibrate in love, will respond to my thought because our, we're in harmony, we're in resonance. If I send out a thought of fear, negative and scare, and I can't do this and I'm afraid, I say, what do you think is going to vibrate? I say, love is not going to vibrate. Only things that you would be afraid of, things you would be, you know, have fear over, they'll vibrate. And I say, so put it all together. Oh my God, we're creators. And we come in to this body to create. And that what we create and what we experience is not kept in us. Our mind translates it into electromagnetic vibrations that go back to the field. And that integrates with our spiritual vibration because they're the two in resonance. I'm in resonance with the spirit and the spirit is in resonance with the body. Why? We're using the same vibration. So our lives make a difference that we live here. And I say, what? First of all, we're creators. We're very powerful. I go, until a creator is programmed not to be powerful. And then that creator, by programming, will say, okay, I'm not powerful, and give up our power. And we have been systematically programmed to question who and what we are, when the fact is we came here as creators. And I go, why did we come here for the creation? And then I go, because we get a feedback that goes back to the source that says, what do you want? And you come here and try and create it. And when you find that love, and when you find that harmony, you start to realize you're glowing. What you're glowing, your energy vibration of love is going back to the universe to, to resonate with you and make you a stronger love vibration. This is a time in history where it's not enough to know. Mm. This is a time in history to know how. And if you rewind the tape 10 years ago, you know, information was the thing that stimulated thought, stimulated new ideas. And, and as we learn new things, we make new connections in our brains. So <clears throat> as we begin to add new stitches into that three-dimensional tapestry in our mind, we're beginning to cause our mind to function in new ways. But the key then is to apply it, to personalize it, to do something with it. And, and 10 years ago, when I went out and got in front of an audience and talked about the application, it, it, nobody wanted to step outside that philosophical, theoretical, intellectual realm, right? Because doing something means you're gonna have to change something about yourself. Painful. Yeah, you're gonna get uncomfortable, yeah. right? And um, <clears throat> I think we're in an age of information. And in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. And because of technology, we have access to so much content and information creates awareness. And awareness is consciousness. And you can't have consciousness without energy. They're, they work together. So there's an energetic change, I think, that's taking place in the world right now where people are so informed that old models, old paradigms are beginning to break down, mm -hmm. whether it's the medical model or the religious model, the education model, journalism, uh, the, the economy, you know, um, politics. It's all beginning to... Uh, come to the surface because something else has to come out. And, and I think that one of the things that uh, people are realizing is that you don't have to be a Buddhist monk to do this or uh, a nun with 40 years of devotion. You just gotta understand the formula. And just like any skill or anything you learn, you gotta go from thinking to doing to being. You gotta take knowledge, you, you create the experience, and if you keep doing it over and over again, you start getting a skill or you start getting wise about how to do it. And you, you know that you know how to do it. If you're sitting down and you start thinking about 
uh, some future worst case scenario that you're conjuring up in your mind and you begin to feel the emotion of that event, your body doesn't know the difference between the event that's taking place in your world, outer world, and what you're creating by emotion or thought alone. So most people then, they're, they're constantly reaffirming their emotional states. So when it comes time to give up that emotion, they can say, I really want to do it, but really the body is stronger than the mind because it's been conditioned that way. So the servant now has become the master, and the person all of a sudden, once they step into that unknown, they'd rather feel guilt and suffering because at least they can predict it. Being the unknown is a scary place for most people because the unknown is uncertain. People say to me, well, I can't predict my future. I'm in the unknown, and I always say the best way to predict your future is to create it. Not from the known, but from the unknown. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors do you want to demonstrate in one day? The act of rehearsing the mentally, closing your eyes, and rehearsing the action. The rehearsing the reaction of what you want? or the Yeah, action of the action want? of what you want. By closing your eyes and mentally rehearsing some action. If you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between what you're imaging and what you're experiencing in 3D world. So then you begin to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like the event has already occurred. Now, your brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it's a map to the future. And if you keep doing it, priming it that way, the hardware becomes a software program. And who knows, you just may start acting like a happy person. You know, Dr. Maxwell Maltz wrote a book back around 1960. It was called Self-Image Psychology, Psycho-Cybernetics. It's a phenomenal book. He said it was the greatest discovery of his generation. He was a cosmetic or a reconstructive surgeon. And he found he would do work on people. He might have been a nose job or removed a terrible scar. And he noticed that when he did that, there was a phenomenal change in their personality. But he noticed with others, he would make a phenomenal physical change and there was no change in their personality. And that led him to postulate that we have two images. We have the one that's coming back from the mirror, but we've got an inner image. And that inner self image is literally controlling our life. You will find people that have a very poor self image or low self esteem. They won't look you straight in the eye. They're afraid to shake hands with you. They're very shy and withdrawn. They go through life hiding from life. They don't like themselves. They don't know themselves. Do you know when a person improves their self-image, they change their entire life. Their income changes, their relationship changes, their health changes. And do you know how you do that? Start studying you. Start to find out more about you. There's something phenomenal about you. Do you know, when I began to study this material 57 years ago, I had very poor self-image. I had low self-esteem. I took dumb jobs. I never earned any money. I never had fun. I had poor relationships. And as I started to study, started to study real solid information, everything in my life started to improve. I've got friends all over the world today. I earn millions of dollars. I'm in my 80s and I get as much energy as a person in their 30s. Do you see, when you start to understand really who you are, you're God's highest form of creation. There's things about you that just about blow your mind as you start to study and really understand them. You'll walk a little taller, you'll stand a little straighter, and you know something? You'll enjoy a whole lot more of life. See this line? That's called the terror barrier. Yeah, jumping at you, isn't it? And on the other side of the terror barrier, is something we call freedom. And you know, very few people get through that terror barrier. It's rather sad. Freedom is available to everyone. There isn't anyone that cannot live the way they want to live. See? Why don't they? Why don't they? They don't know. And they don't even know they don't know. Now I'm going to show you why people experience buyer's remorse when they buy something they really want and then they back away or they go to move and they don't they go to change jobs and they don't they go to move to another city and they don't why fear causes them to stay where they are there's the individual the x represents the unknown factor the paradigm 
Now, there's a power flowing into this individual's mind, and they can make anything out of it they want. Remember we said we had the ability to choose? What do they choose? They choose thoughts that are in harmony with the paradigm. Now, here's an important point. The paradigm controls the vibration of this thing we call our body. Our body is a molecular instrument. That's really what it is. It's a mass of molecules and a very high speed of vibration. The vibration that the body's in, on a conscious level, we call feeling. When a person says they feel this way or they feel that way, what they're really doing is describing the vibration they're in. Now, they choose thoughts that harmonize with the vibration they're in, so they feel comfortable. They may not like the results, but they're comfortable. Now, let's move ahead. Let's take a look here. Those people are getting X-type results, and they don't like it. Do you know what the problem with them? They're in bondage. These people are locked up. Do you know, paradigm is like keeping a person in a prison. Only there's no locks on the door. They can open the prison and walk out into freedom anytime they want, and they don't. They keep getting the same results over and over and over again. They're in bondage. Now, let's go ahead. Here's the same person. X-type conditioning, X-type vibration. The power's flowing into them. And for some strange reason, from left field, ba-boom, in comes a Y-type idea. What is a Y-type idea? The Y-type idea represents anything that you might want to do that you're not doing. It might be moved to another city, change jobs, sell the house, buy the farm, whatever it may be. Ask the little girl for the date. Ask the guy to go to lunch. Go make the sale. Buy what you want. Go where you want to go. That's the why idea. But as long as the why idea is just in the conscious mind, it's just going to be an intellectual exercise. It's never going to happen. So how do we make it happen? Well, that's when everything goes haywire. Here we are here. Same person. Okay? The power flows in. And what do they do? They got the why type idea. Now, for some strange reason, they know that they've got to get emotionally involved if they're going to act on that idea. They don't understand what's going to happen. But clearly understand this. Your central nervous system is the most complex electrical system in the universe. The central nervous system is mind-boggling. It would make the electrical system in a supercomputer look like a toy. Now, the second you take the idea from your intellect and impress it upon the subject of mind, that's when all hell breaks loose. Because the body moves in to an XY vibration. It's not in the X vibration. Not the one that we're comfortable with. May not like the results, but we're comfortable. No, on a conscious level, everything's going crazy. On a conscious level, we experience doubt. The doubt turns into an emotion called fear, and that fear is expressed through the body as anxiety. See, that person is getting emotionally involved to move ahead. Do you know what happens? They hit that terror barrier and they bounce off it and right back into bondage. And they're so relieved to get back there. They're back where they're comfortable. They've canceled the sale. They've decided not to move. They're going to stay in the job that they don't like. At least they're comfortable. Now, that's not a very good way to live. And you know something? That's something everybody experiences if they're going to grow. You're going to hit that terror barrier. See, the terror barrier is going beyond where you're at, going to a new level. I'm going to tell you something. When I set a goal, if, if, if it doesn't scare and excite me at the same time, I know I'm going in the wrong direction. Now, I also understand that my paradigm is going to try and get me to bounce back to where I was. It doesn't want me to move ahead. I don't want to live there. I lived there for the first 26 years of my life. And for the last 50, I've had a phenomenal life. And it just keeps getting better. And I want you to do the same thing. Understand what I've just said. I'm going to back this up. They got emotionally involved in the why idea. That moved their body into a different vibration. On a conscious level, they're experiencing some crazy stuff. They start to doubt their ability and they'll never be able to pay for it. They, they experience fear. The fear expresses itself as anxiety. 
and bang, you bounce off that terror barrier and you're right back. Oh, I might not be earning much here, but I know what it is. Uh, I, uh, I would love to move there, but I, I'm comfortable here. I think I'll just stay here. These people are acting like they have a contract to live forever, and they don't. Do you know what to do? Say, I'm going to get rid of all that. I understand it's there, but I don't want any part of it. And I'm going to go crashing right through that terror barrier. Now, does that get rid of the X energy? No. The X energy is still there, you see. But at least you're over into freedom. You made the move. You did it. And if you continue to feed the right information into your mind, Keep feeding that why idea. Keep getting emotionally involved in the why idea. You're there. You're on the road. Keep doing that. You're going to find that the paradigm is going to change and it'll just all go away. And you know where you're living? In freedom. You're living where you want to live. Buyer's remorse is when you cancel the sale. Buyer's remorse is when you stop just before you buy what you really want before you go for the thing that's going to change your life and you know it. It's not moving to the other city. It's not starting the business of your dreams. It's not stepping out and betting on yourself. That's a terror barrier that's causing that. And if you don't learn to go through the terror barrier, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to stay right where you are for the rest of your days. That's not a good place to be. What did Joseph Campbell say? So true. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. How many times have you had somebody say to you, hey, have you got a minute, Bob? Have you got a minute? They don't want a minute. I want you to think about that. I read a poem one time. It said, I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. It was forced upon me. I can't refuse it. I didn't seek it and I didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. It's only a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Well, at any rate, I thought, I'm going to put this on a video, and I'm just going to share it with everybody, just this one little part out of the seminar I'm making. I want you to look at this sand timer, and let this, I want you to think about your life. The sand in the top of the glass represents the future. The sand in the bottom of the glass represents the past. Now, do you know, we know what's in the past, and yet we can't do anything about it. Do you know what the trick is? You don't know how much sand's in the top of the glass. You may think you have a lot. You might only have a little. Then again, you may think you have a little, and you might have a lot. When I was a little boy, I was raised by my grandmother. And I don't know, when I was a little gaffer, she was probably 60, but as long as I can remember, Grandma would say, I'll soon be gone, dear, I'll soon be gone. Well, you know, we loved her. She was really an angel of God, but we thought she was never going to go. She lived to be 94 for 30-some years. I'll soon be gone. She didn't think she had much time left. She had 34 years left. Now, about the same time, I had a buddy of mine, Bob Yates. He was just 16. And bang, he ran into the abutment of a bridge and his life was snuffed out. If you had asked him a half hour before how much sand he had left, he would have said at least a half a century. He didn't have a half an hour. See, the trick is we don't know how much sand we have left. The future, we don't know. The past, it's gone. Now, the only thing you can deal with is what's right here, right now. And if you look, the sand is always moving. Now, think of this. You see, I was working on that, and then I was working on a graph I've got here on my computer, and I'm thinking of the time somebody said, hey, have you got a minute? Well, they don't really want a minute. Do you know if you're earning $50,000 a year, a minute's 42 cents. A half hour is $12.50. If we take that ahead a bit, if you're earning $80,000 a year, a minute's 67 cents. Half hour is $20. If you're earning $150,000 a year, got a minute? <laughs> it costs you $1.25 a minute. A half hour is $37.50. So if you see if somebody said, do you want to stop for a cup of coffee? Well, if you're earning a quarter of a million dollars a year, a minute is $2.08. Half hour is $62.50. And then, of course, you've got the coffee to pay for on top of that. So you see, the point is this. This is all we've got right here, right now. 
We don't know how much we have left in the future, but we do know what we've got now. And I have found the people that win are the people who make up their mind. They're not going to waste the minutes. They're going to be productive. They're going to make it happen every minute. You know, the people you surround yourself with have a phenomenal impact on your life. I think it was Carl Menninger from the Menninger Foundation one time said, environment is more important than heredity. The people we're surrounded by have a greater bearing on our life and our success in life than what's built into the genes at birth. There's genetic conditioning, there's environmental conditioning. Well, this environmental conditioning goes on all the way through life. You will find as you improve the quality of your life, improve your thinking, you're going to attract a different group of people into your life and they are going to add to your life. See, the people we're surrounded by, their thinking is going right into our mind. We want to mix with people who are really making it happen. Take a look at your five people that you're with most often and ask yourself, if I have children, would I want them to grow up be like them? If the answer is no, you better start looking for some new friends. If the answer is yes, you're already in the right circle of people. Think about what I'm saying. The people we're surrounded with have a phenomenal impact on our life and help make us who we are. Select a person who is already doing something that you'd like to do. Get to know that person. Mm -hmm. Go to the experts for advice. Don't ask the person next door, your mother, father, brother, or the guy that works beside you, because they don't necessarily know. There's no point in asking a person how to earn a lot of money if they're only earning 10,000 a year. They don't know. They knew they'd probably be earning a lot. It's like, don't fair. go to a sick doctor if you want to get healthy. Okay. So you find someone that you can go to for advice. Get a real good book and lock into that book and start to study it. Like, I've had this one that looks like a Bible, you know. But this is Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. I've been reading this thing now for 23 years. I'll probably read it for another 23 years. I get another good book that I brought over here today. It's called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. Now, I'm not getting a commission for selling this. The author's dead now. He's been gone for a couple of years. But Dr. Joseph Murphy wrote this book, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. And that's probably one of the best books that you're ever going to find because you're going to learn something about your mind when you read this book. Okay. Now, I read a lot of books. I've got probably a thousand books sitting in my den at home in my library. But the one that I, car I carry it everywhere I go and I read it all the time is Think and Grow Rich. I never stop reading it. Now, where's the value for you to reread that and read well, it again? I mean, you must, you must know it well enough that... Uh, I think I could probably recite it verbatim. But the secret is, I once read in a book where it said, when you read a good book through mm -hmm. the second time, you don't see something in it that you didn't see before. You see something in yourself that wasn't there before. You see, when I read this, I create a, a, a greater awareness. William James from Harvard said, believe and your belief will create the fact. All things are possible if you believe. Well, you know, I studied for a long time. I started to study this book, Think and Grow Rich. And he talks about belief in here. He says, you're not ready for what you want until you believe you can get it. I found that the only two sources of reference we could go to to find out anything about ourselves is science and religion. They all say you've got to believe. So I got figuring out, how do, you, how do you believe? How do you change a belief? Interesting subject, because I'm going to tell you something. Your results are nothing but the manifestation of your belief system. Well, our belief system, now listen carefully, is based upon our evaluation of something. And frequently, when we reevaluate a situation, our belief about that situation will change. Let me repeat that. Our belief system is based upon our evaluation of something. Frequently, if we reevaluate a situation, our belief about it will change. I began reevaluating who I was. I started to study. I never stopped studying. And I found as I reevaluated, I had a much higher opinion of myself. I found out things about me that I would have never believed if you had told me. The power that's locked up within us, the marvelous system we've got. Do you know the blood circulates through your veins every 33 seconds, through hundreds of miles of passageway, bang, just like that, colors all the food in and all the garbage out. Stop and think of the central nervous system. It's the most complex electrical system in the world. And you've got it. Think of your brain, an electronic switching station like that you can change the vibration of yourself and everything around you. We have awesome powers. 
and it's all based on what you believe about you. You know, many years ago, I read a book by Terry Cole Whitaker. It was a classic. What you think of me is none of my business. Think of the amount of time that is wasted on negative energy wondering what other people think of you. What they think of you really doesn't make any difference. It's what you think of you that makes a difference. So as you go through the day, don't worry about what other people think of you. Just say, I'm all right. I'm God's highest form of creation. He said that success was the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Anyone that has a goal and they're moving towards it, they're successful. <clears throat> Most people think that you're successful if you have a lot of money. Quite often you have a lot of money if you're successful, but it isn't. I wouldn't say Mother Teresa has a lot of money. Okay. You know, but she's a pretty successful lady. So it's... Um, okay, so that barrier to success... Well, there's a, there's a couple of them. Okay. I think there's two barriers. One is our conditioning. The conditioning that takes place in our subconscious mind from the time we're infants. All we can do is act and talk like the people around us. That's why we learn the language we learned. If there was ten languages spoken in our home, we'd learn ten languages without any trouble. Hmm. There's usually one, and that's the only one we ever learn. And we grow older and we think, well, I couldn't learn another language. We could learn a hundred if we wanted to. You can do anything. But I think we're conditioned. We have a, a real strong conditioning, usually with not some very good ideas. And then that, that's the, the, the barrier that's inside us. The one that's outside of us is our environment. We have a tendency to act like everybody around us. And if you think about this, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because if you study statistics, 95% of the people live their entire life and never live the way they want to live. Yeah. You know that 95% of the population in this country, let's say in North America, okay. the richest continent in the history of the world, they'll work productively, let's say for 40 of their 65 years, okay. and they'll end up with hardly any money. Well, there's got to be something wrong. So there's not well, much... 5% of the people end up financially comfortable or independent. Are you trying to depress this, Bob? Because that's, uh... No, actually, I think, it's, I think it's quite an exciting idea. Because, you see, the idea behind it is that anybody can win. Anyone at all. But if we start studying these statistics, I think we'll arrive at the conclusion, geez, I better start thinking for myself rather than follow everybody. Most people, they get a job, they look around, they see how everybody else is doing their work, and they start doing it the same way. Mm -hmm. They should stop and think, I wonder if any of these people know what they're doing. You know, <laughs> is there a better way to do it? But don't we have a need to fit in? I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to stand out, we don't want to get fired, we don't want to make waves. Uh, exactly, exactly. Just fall into line, you know, take a number, be like everybody around. <laughs> You know, that'd be great in the animal kingdom, I, but human beings aren't supposed to live that way. I think we should make a few waves. We yeah. should maybe stand out, be different. Not, not for the sake of being different, okay. but because we are different. We all think different thoughts. And I believe we should start to think and build images in our mind of what we'd like to do and then set out and do it. Okay, Emerson me... did that, Edison did that, Marconi did that, Samuel Morse did that, uh, Buckminster Fuller did that. We could go on and on and on. Okay. They were different. They stood out. They made a few waves. I don't think you determine what your purpose is. I think you discover what your purpose is. There's a difference. Determining indicates deciding. Um, and I don't think you decide. I think if you go about it the right way, you discover it. Like there's some people that should be painting all day. They're great artists. I think Michelangelo was obviously a great artist, a great sculptor. I mean, that was his purpose in his life. Well, I believe my purpose is doing what I'm doing. Your purpose is why you get out of bed in the morning. Do you know why you get up? Well, most people say, well, it's to go to work. Well, that'd be a good reason to stay in bed. You know, you say, well, everybody's doing it. That'd be another reason to stay in bed. If you're ever doing what everybody's doing, you're probably going in the wrong direction. Your purpose is your reason for living. What you want to do is sit down and maybe take a pen and a pad and then ask yourself, what do I really love doing? Now, you may have to spend a while at this. You might get up an hour early every morning and go sit under a tree somewhere if you're in a nice climate or pick a favorite chair, some place where you're not going to be disturbed and totally relax 
and say, if I could spend my life doing something, what do I really love doing? Now, since you don't ask yourself that question every day, it might take a while for this answer to come to the surface. But it comes to your consciousness. And it may take a while. You may have to do this every morning for three months. But it would be well invested. You've got to wake up. You see, all we're ever going to get is awareness. We've already got everything. The only thing we lack is the awareness of what we've got. We're God's highest form of creation. There's nothing on the planet that will equal us. Well, that's all, we're, that's all any of us are after. All the problems in the world come from ignorance. That's God. the purpose of life, to overcome ignorance, develop awareness. The only way to overcome er ignorance is through knowledge. And the only way to get the knowledge is to study. Most people, they finish school, close the book, say, I got it, that's over. I'm never going to open another book as long as I live. <laughs> They're screwed. It's all over. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you're different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. If you want some incredible motivation from Wayne Dyer, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Have a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing. One of the central principles of my life is that no one knows enough 